Hey guys, Bugcat7 here. Okay, it is Thursday, October 24, 2019, and I want to thank you for visiting the Stonewall Research Channel here on YouTube. Thank you very much. I really do appreciate it. Alright guys, well, we're going to take a look at some very interesting, mysterious, enigmatic mounds that can be found in uh, western New York State at a place called Perch Lake. And these type of mounds are called annular mounds, okay, or ring mounds, okay. And here's what they look like. All right, so this is a picture taken from this article from the New York State Museum, which uh, got some money from the National Science Foundation to take a look at these things because nobody had been paying attention to them at all. And the interesting thing about this is that this site has a sister site with identical mounds in it in Canada, right across Lake Ontario. This is very, Perch Lake is very close to Lake Ontario, and it's in a very far western New York, okay, where it's sort of plateaus out down there, okay, so it has a sister site right across Lake Ontario, and no mention of it at all in this uh, article done by uh, New York State uh, Museum here, okay, on geoarchaeology. And I guess they had their people take a look at this thing. And there's the picture again. Okay, so let's let's take a look at these very interesting mounds. And the reason you, you probably haven't heard of them is because they're not effigy mounds. They're not burial mounds like the Adena and the Hopewell. They're not temple mounds like Cahokia where you have this sort of pyramidal type mound with a flat top where a structure may have been or may not have been. They're not like any of those things. They're just these very odd things, and they're in abundance uh, here in Western New York. In fact, in fact it's one of uh, the, it, it is the largest cluster of mounds in New York State. So, and it's very interesting. It has this sister site that's not mentioned in this article here, but uh, one from Canada, researched on there uh, by uh, Can Canada Archaeology. Um, they they're they're have a direct link to it as far as they're concerned. But let's read from this thing and let's see what these annular mounds may or may not have been because apparently the archaeologists and anthropologists that have been looking at these things don't quite know exactly what they were for. Even after intense um you know, scrutiny. Okay, so the annular mounds at Perch Lake. First recorded in the mid-1850s, the unusual mounds at Perch Lake in Jefferson County, New York, have long eluded satisfactory archaeological explanation. With funding from the National Science Foundation, we've been exploring some of the geo-archaeological and archaeobotanical aspects of these fascinating features. The mounds at Perch Lake are annular or ring-shaped features made of earth and stone. So... When you see these things, it's actually build, uh, you know, a stone mound first and then cover it with earth, apparently. Recent walkover survey in the 4 by 10 kilometer area surrounding the Perch Lake Basin documents 70 mounds, making this by far the largest mound group in New York. The mounds are small and subtle, but consistently complete circles or slight ovals. Detailed topographic surveys show that they rarely exceed a meter in height. Outer diameters average about 11 meters, and the ring crest defining a central depression have an average diame uh, diameter of about 5 meters. There are no ditches or borrow pits associated with these mounds. Okay, so it's not like a barrel mound, okay? And there are no other mound forms in the Perch Lake area. So isn't that interesting? There's no other mound forms except for these very low um, bowl-shaped ring mounds that are not barrel mounds or, you know, with a trench around it or anything. So 
it's just very interesting that they're highly clustered here and, and also there in uh, Canada as well. Okay, a mound at Perch Lake in Jefferson County, northern New York, based on a 1901 field sketch by W.M. Beauchamp, 1905 Perch Lake Mounds. Okay, so Beauchamp was a amateur or one of the, you know, first serious um, or noted archaeologists. And you can see a lot of his work in your local library just about anywhere. Okay, so first reported by Franklin Howe in 1851 Regents Report, the Birch Lake Mound soon became the subject of much speculation and numerous excavations. They figured prominently during the formation of the Jefferson County Historical Society in 1886, attracting the attention of William M. Beauchamp, one of the pioneers of New York archaeology. In 1901, Beauchamp made several direct field observations at Perch Lake that culminated in his 1905 New York State SM monograph, I guess New York State Museum monograph, the last comprehensive survey of the mounds prior to the present study. Beauchamp concluded that the annular rings were the remains of ancient lodge sites, but many since have questioned this interpretation. So here's a picture of what's left of one of these things. You can sort of bowl impression in the air. It's just barely visible here. But because they're very low mounds, similar to that of the serpent man, which I don't think was more than a meter and a half high. It's not more than a meter and a half high. So probably I would imagine a serpent mound may be connected with these mounds or, you know, the peoples who were doing this stuff were involved somehow because there's so, this low style mound, but there's a purpose to these things. And that's what so, makes them so distinct, you see. Because there's a purpose to this, and they're not sure what it is. Over the years, numerous explanations for the mounds have been offered by archaeologists. The accompanying diagram organizes these diverse interpretive strains using a schema that helps to illustrate how the method of multiple alternative hypotheses can be used in a reiterative way to work towards better explanation. P on the left is the overarching phenomenon of the Perch Lake Mounds. On the right, proposed explanations are placed into three broad but not necessarily exclusive categories. R signals rejection of the hypothesis on the basis of the archaeological evidence. So they have this whole thing plotted out here. So you can see... You know, see with the R's, this is Beauchamp's and Skinner and Parker in 1923. This is a rejected all of that and these ideas. So they still don't know what it is, but, you know, this is the point of this thing. It's complete hypothesis what these things are. So it's open to discussion what they could have been. I have my own ideas about it, but let's read on. The mounds are not burial mounds or mortuary sites as no human remains have ever been found in them. They contain much charcoal and burnt rock, but few other artifacts. They lack plant or animal remains expected if they were food processing sites or habitation structures. In the present study, we are focused on conducting a field census of the mounds for preservation purposes and on gathering basic descriptive data that better document some of the morphometric and geophysical attributes of the mound. So, thank goodness, for whatever reasons or whatever cockamamie hypothesis they come up with or whatever, that they're going to preserve them and nobody's using it for road fill or uh, bulldozing them down while nobody's looking. Prior to the study, no one had made any real attempt to look for food remains to address the suite of economic hypothesis or to study in detail the internal structure and history of a mound. To do this, we conducted limited test excavations by working off 
of reopened historical excavations in two mounds on the rocky high banks that formed the eastern shore of Perch Lake. So these are things were perched on summits above these areas or whatever. So just interesting what the heck they might have been. New food remains were found in the newly excavated samples despite a large and intensive archaeobotanical flotation effort in the field and in the laboratory. So we reject a series of economic hypotheses, including our own favored one. This is no small gain, however, as it places exploration, exploration and refinement of the other hypothesis on firmer ground. Stratigraphic studies show that the mounds are planned, carefully made geometric structures of earth and stone, internally complex but with sharply delineate, delineated outer margins. A Perch Lake mound was first a made earthen structure that later became the site of many subsequent burn episodes in which much charcoal was produced when the fires were extinguished under soil or stones. Few intact burn surfaces are preserved as the soil and stones were subsequently reorganized in an act of mound building that would leave the mound in its very distinctive form. So they're saying they're re or constantly reorganizing these things. The two tested mounds were found to have been made at the sites of the tree tip where the pit and knoll disturbed soils remold, were remolded into the ring-shaped form. Near surface soil horizons in the area that would become the mound were also used for the earthen fraction of the rings, and their excavation may have served as the initial marking out of the mound space that would be maintained and subsequent use with subsequent use. 67 new high-resolution radiocarbon dates place construction and near-continuous ritual use of these mounds minimally between 50 BC and AD 1425, so that's an awfully long time, okay? And I still say their dating is way off on these things. They have this new world bias. I'm telling you, it's built into everything that they follow the program, all this kind of stuff. So they're constantly dating these things incorrectly, in my opinion, and a lot of other people's. Okay, so that's the whole article on it. And it's curiously short and not a lot of details and everything, but... I found another article done in Canada, okay, by Ontario Archaeology, okay, where they're trying to figure out what these things might have been, okay, and you see in the article here, <clears throat> in what must be among the earliest published accounts of archaeological excavations undertaken in the province of Ontario, if not Canada, Thomas Walbridge, 1860, provided a summary of the results of trenching through at least five examples of a distinct class of late middle woodland mounds found along the shores of the Bay of Quint. Walbridge was both intrigued by these unusual features of what she, he of which he estimated that there were about 100 in Prince Edward County. So, and he's saying, the frustra and frustrated by the apparent sparseness of artifacts or burials to be found within them. I and there's a lot of secondary burials. Okay, so I'm just going to read a few snippets out of this thing. I can't read the whole thing. It's a huge, huge article. I would, will include it in the description. Give me some time. You've got to catch up on a lot of these videos where I include the material here for you to go through. But I want to read a few little things. Okay. Okay, so it's just, it's talking about what they originally assumed these things were dwelling, you know, the foundations of dwelling sites, so hunt rings, camp bottoms, okay, that was bow champ, and they, they, I showed you in this other article from the estate, they dismissed these ideas, they dismissed them here too, but they're just going by this early information here. Okay. And they have analogs to it that are not only here in um, 
in in uh, North America, but also in Europe. Okay. Okay, so it's saying here, if we look beyond the Northeast, we will find that there may be more appropriate analogs for the interpretation of the Quint and Perch Lake Mounds. Okay, so you see they've got it together here. All right. They, they've connected the two, but somehow in the New York State Museum, that no mention of Quint. So just... Keep that in mind. I don't know why, but they must have their reasons. And I think one of the reasons is because they can't explain it. And they don't want to get too deep into the weeds with their, because they don't know what the heck they are. But they to go over a lot in this. These are found to be a far off field as Texas the, and Atlantic Europe. Okay, so this is talking about the analogs. The interpretation of Burton Stone mounds in these different regions has been the subject of considerable discussion as well. Researchers in these areas have sought even farther afield for analogs and have contested interpretations that have been dominant for decades. By a curious coincidence, these debates have taken place more or less simultaneously, but each has been rehearsed with little awareness that others are grappling with very similar questions. In pursuing the question of the character and functions of the Quint and Perch Lake burnt stone mounds, it must be emphasized that the intention here is not to disparage those who have given their consideration to these features Thoughts were formulated, which in turn influenced judgments concerning the appropriateness of interpretive analogs and to highlight the need for renewed investigation of these sites. And they, okay, so they, you got some interest in these sites, which are not all these other burial mounds, effigies, temple mounds, whatever it is. Okay, so just going through, um, the earliest interpretations of these, okay, and I just want to show you here where there, here's the Quint group of Quint Bay there in Canada and also along the um, Rice Lake and Trent Valley, another, there's a hundred of them there, and 70 here, although I heard them mention in this article that some of them were destroyed. So at least 70 at Perch Lake here. So you have these sister sites here with these weird things that are both sides are trying to explain. No mention in New York of the Quint group here or anything, but the, wouldn't that be necessary information? I mean, but they're leaving it out for whatever reason. Okay. The descriptions of the construction of the mounds provided by Walbridge and Beauchamp agree that the typical form consisted of a ring or a truncated cone, quote unquote, formed of burnt and fire cracked granite rocks and cobbles. Okay, so what's interesting about these granite rocks and cobbles is that it's not it's not common. Granite is not common in the area. A lot of limestone is apparently and where did they get it all? They had to go collecting it. So it's very conscious acts here and specific intent. Okay, so they're showing Perch Lake here, some early uh, drawing, I guess it's Bochamps, okay, there's the Perch Lake, okay, in this early illustration here, and there's the site, okay, with the mounds, and showing a little bit of a more closer detail of this, I guess, a small area, because there's 70 mounds, so it's got to be widespread, he just didn't, didn't realize it or whatever. Okay, so they found a lot of charcoal in these mounds, in these rocks. Okay, that they're talking about it here. Walbridge and Broke Champ also noted that the burnt rock comprising the surrounding ring of mounds generally consisted of igneous materials that were less abundant or easily found than the local predominant limestones. Beauchamp took this to mean that the changes limestone undergoes when subjected to burning were seen to be objectionable on the part of the builders of these monuments. So interesting to note that. 
he needs a much harder stone. Okay, so this is another illustration by Bonchamp. Two mounts on Hyde Creek, north of Perch Lake, as sketched by William Bonchamp, 1905. A schematic internal plan of the figure 3A mount is provided in figure 5. So there's another one. And here's how it is. Okay, cross section of a quint mound excavation excavated by Wall Bridge at Massagua Point. So they they're identical mounds, and so why they don't include the quint site in with the New York Museum uh, article there is very curious to me. Okay, so they found some burials there at the Quint site there in Canada. Okay, but, and here's, uh, Beauchamp's 1905 plan of a burnt stone mound on High Creek showing an idealized rectangular slab line fireplace in the center of the feature. So it's an idealized one. It's just, you know. Imaginary, I guess, but there's something square in the bottom of the thing. Okay, some other illustrations. Cross section of a burnt stone mound at Cataraugus Creek. Okay, let's see. I just wanted to know, there's a couple things in here I wanted to go over, but it's just an incredibly long article here. Okay, so the going over analogs, some analogs found in Texas, okay, some, in any case, and um, they determined mostly that these these burials were secondary. They weren't included with the bands, they were just very later burials, okay. Let's see if we can find some of this stuff. Okay, so we're talking about William A. Ritchie here. Okay, and that's William A. Ritchie, and I've gone over his work in New York State, but you see how New York State is about this, and Ritchie's not even, see, when Ritchie ceased to write on the subject of the burnt stone mounds, however, the mo momentum was lost. These features came to be treated in a summary fashion as part of a generic package of middle woodland cultural traits, even if they were inexplicable, say so. Ritchie was kind of a punk and a sellout, and I'm sure, you know, he was one of these acolytes of Alice Herdlisko, which didn't want, want this stuff to come out. He was against all of that archaeology giants, and, you know, he poisoned the well, so to speak. Okay. The most convincing explanation offered as to the function of these structures is that they in that it is the only carefully considered exploration of either structural analogs or northeastern North American Aboriginal cultural practice is that they were communal sweat lodges used for ritual. Okay, so they think there's, some think they're sweat lodges. Okay, so you're talking about maiden-like accumulation. Fire-baked soil lined the sides and bottoms of the features. And here they go into more analogs, okay, in Texas and in Ireland. Okay, so you have the Ireland, the Celtic thing being brought up again or whatever, but again, we're going back to the Irish burnt mounds, as they call them, or cookies, as they 
whatever, but they, they even this research, they're not sure of the function even in this research. So they don't know what the function of these things are, no matter where the heck they are. But apparently, these are just these sites in uh, New York and Canada are just huge ones by comparison. And, you know, there's a lot of technical stuff here, but again, and as the other article stated, there was no um, uh, plant or animal um, leftovers that they could detect. They're, they're saying these were, you know, one of the theories is that they were used for, like, uh, you know, industrial processing cooking, which... I can understand that from an industrial design point of view. Okay, it says right here. It is clear that the Quint and Perch Lake burnt stone mounds bear close similarities with sites found in Texas and Atlantic Europe and undoubtedly elsewhere, namely the massive quantities of shattered burnt rock enclosing a small area, the presence of hearts, deposits of ash and charcoal-rich soil, a general darth of associated artifacts. Some other parallels with the burnt mounds of Ireland and Britain are even more striking, although these must remain only subjective impressions until further research is devoted to the Ontario and New York sites. In terms of site distribution, there is a possible tendency with the Quint and Perch Lake sites to be located in watery areas. This seems most evidence in the Perch Lake region where Beauchamp mapped many mounds in the marshy area surrounding the lake, just as in the case for the Irish Volacta Pida Fiad. In terms of site structure, several of the Perch Lake mounds and at least one of the Quint mounds likely possess more or less centrally located stone slab lines, sepulchral chambers, or fireplaces that were excavated in, into the subsoil. Although Ritchie was disinclined to accept the presence of such features, perhaps in consequence of his reliance on narrow trench excavation techniques that are highly reminiscent of the troughs found in European burnt mounds, which clearly served as tanks in which water was heated. So, <clears throat> he's saying how it's so similar to this, but they're still not in agreement about it. Okay.